Hey folks, okay, so I want to talk to you about your IWAs. So I've read everyone's IWA and I think they are um, really strong in a lot of ways and I really, really enjoyed reading all of your IWAs. And basically what I did, because you know that I'm not allowed to write feedback on your IWAs, is that as I read them I had um, a separate Word document open where I took notes for each of your papers of the comments I would have written if I were allowed to write those comments. And then, after reading all of your papers in both classes, I sat down and I looked at the kinds of comments that appeared over and over and over again. So the things that clearly a lot of students are still maybe struggling with, are not totally clear on. And I just want to um, take a couple of minutes here to highlight what those things are, what did I notice in your papers, and also what are some ways that you can tackle um, revising those issues, locating them in your own papers and making the revisions that are necessary to make as you sort of push forward in the revision process this week. I also will be asking you to revisit these ideas next week when you become peer reviewers. So again, I'm not allowed to look at these drafts. So next week, you're going to be the critical voice in the ear of your classmates. And these are some of the major things that maybe you want to be on the lookout for. And maybe you want to be able to provide meaningful feedback to your classmates. So the first thing I want to note is some things that were really successful in your papers. Um, I noticed that there was a lot of strong research. I was super impressed at the quality of the bibliographies I was looking at. A lot of you don't have, or didn't in this last draft, have complete bibliographies yet, um, but I could tell from your citations, from your quotations, that we are looking at really meaty, lengthy, thoughtful bibliographies here, maybe 15, maybe 18, maybe 20 sources um, that are not just people who are talking, but who are real scholars, you know, professors and people writing in peer-reviewed journals and people writing in books. Um, and that takes a lot of time, guys. I'm really impressed at the the quality of what I saw there in terms of that strong research and also the scholarly nature of that research. We were looking at sources that are scholarly and sources that are um, uh, really, really reliable. That also means that those papers were hard to read. So thank you for sort of working your way through that really challenging research. Um, I was looking at your research questions, at your thesis statements. Guys, you are, are really doing thoughtful, innovative work. You know, it'd be really easy in this paper to kind of go down a rabbit hole of, um, you know, asking the research question, like, what is happiness? And, and really, for the most part, you guys have created spin-off research questions that are deeply compelling and that, yes, connect to the stimulus packet, but aren't just a revisit of a research question of one of the materials in the stimulus packet. You know, students are writing about really, really thoughtful, out-of-the-box ideas. So I'm super, super impressed with the way that you're thinking about this project and this paper. Um, and bear with me because my children are in the room and you will hear their little voices in the background, so sorry about that. Um, I can see evidence of effort and revision. So this is, you know, I've, I've read two versions of your outline at this point. I've read your annotated bibliographies. I've sort of watched as your ideas have progressed here. And I've really seen, again, for the vast majority of you, um, the real revision process coming into play. The way that you are thinking about your own thinking, thinking about your own research, and making thoughtful changes and thoughtful revisions to the work that you're doing. So that's really evident to me as your teacher. And again, I'm super, super proud to see that work. Um, I think, the, in general, the use of the stimulus packet materials is very, very fresh. Um, uh, most of you are not just sort of sticking your stimulus packet materials in because it's like, oh crap, I've got to include a stimulus packet material. I'm seeing them as being genuinely thoughtful and useful sources toward a larger research project, um, and they seem to be to integrated in a really thoughtful way. Um, so those are all really, really strong, powerful, awesome things that you're doing. Um, and then I'm going to highlight just um, this slide is going to be some really, really small, quick things, and then three sort of larger errors as we progress through the presentation. So the first little thing 
um, citing the Dalai Lama. Okay, um, so for to be clear, the Dalai Lama is his title and not his name. His name is not Dalai, first name, Lama, last name. That's his title, sort of like the Pope is a title, okay? Um, so a lot of you are citing the Dalai Lama like this. Um, which makes sense, um, but is not correct. So, um, and some of you likewise are, are citing the Dalai Lama um, you're referring to him as Lama after the first time you cite him. Like normally we would say, you know, scholar Joan Smith declares that Mrs. Park's class is awesome. Smith also agrees that whatever, right? After this first time that we call her Joan Smith, you can call her Smith. That is not the case with the Dalai Lama, that if you say the Dalai Lama says that happiness is uh, related to uh, acceptance of life. Um, Lama also notes that, that that would be incorrect, right? Um, you can call the Dalai Lama the Dalai Lama the, through your whole paper, or you can also call him His Holiness. Um, which is another correct way to refer to him. But don't refer to him as just Lama. That's not his last name. It's a, it's a part of a whole title. And when you cite him, rather than citing um, like this, you would just cite him the Dalai Lama. So that's something that I noticed in, in a lot of papers. And I really understand why that error is there um, and just wanted to highlight it. Okay. Um, some other things. Um, integrating and punctuating quotations. So um, please don't forget that quotations need to be introduced. Um, you cannot start a sentence with quotation marks and end a sentence with quotation marks. You need to have some context either at the beginning of the sentence, normally we put it at the beginning of the sentence, or at the end of the sentence to contextualize that quotation. And um, so when you punctuate your quotations, let's use that um, Mrs. Park's class is the best ever as our example, okay, right? So um, uh, Harvard researcher Joan Smith argues that. So I've added this piece. This is my context at the beginning of the sentence. That's really important. Please don't neglect that. You cannot start your sentence. Just that, this right here cannot be its own sentence. It can't, period, the end. It's not a possibility. We need this context. And then while this is the correct way to cite a quotation if we're not using, um, uh, a citation, if we need to cite this, okay, we put the quotation marks, then we do Smith 52, whatever page number, and then that's where our period goes here at the end. So please make sure that you are, are doing this correctly. Um, it is never correct to have your, you know, uh, she said that she felt uncomfortable. Um, some of you are doing this um, here. Zoe and Xander, shh, mommy's teaching. Um, so uh, some of you are doing this with your period after your quotation marks. Your period needs to be before your quotation marks here. I am sorry about my children in the background, guys. This is just a part of my life now. Um, okay. Um, the word is analyze, no. not analyze. A handful of you are still saying analyze. So the children, shh, mommy is teaching. So um, the, the noun form is analysis. My analysis is such and such. Um, the verb is analyze. I am going to analyze this, not analyze. Okay, analyze is not a word. Um, please make sure you're proofreading carefully. Uh, again, this was a simple draft. I expected typos. I expected errors. That's fine. No problem. Um, but um, there were a lot of typos, a lot of spelling errors, a lot of wonky sentences that didn't totally make sense. Um, so bear with me there. Um, 
in your next draft, make sure you're doing a careful proofread. I strongly yeah. recommend reading your paper out loud. Do I have to come in here and get you So transitioning into your research. Um, so you want to try to make sure that your transitions feel seamless and natural. Um, so, okay, let's look at an example here. You wanna make sure that you're not just sticking research into your paper um, because you feel like this is a research paper and I think I need to stick research in it because that's required. Um, there, this is a place where in a lot of papers I felt like transitions into research were kind of awkward, kind of unclear, kind of clunky. Um, and so I saw a lot of sentences like this one. Uh, Mrs. Park's children make virtual teaching extremely difficult. They are constantly interrupting her while she is working with her urgent needs, and they even scream and beg for things during her calls. The Dalai Lama notes that interruptions in daily life can lead to unhappiness. So, first of all, you can tell where my mind is as I plan this presentation and the things that are making my job challenging here at home. Um, so, you can see the connection here between the research and the argument being made in the paragraph, right? The argument being made in the paragraph, virtual teaching is made difficult by my children. The research, the Dalai Lama notes that interruptions can lead to unhappiness, right? You can feel that connection. But what I haven't done is transitioned into that connection. So here's how we can do that, okay? I'm just gonna show you in a Word document. So if this is my sentence in my paper, okay? Um, what I can do here, leave the sentence as it is, right? Mrs. Park's children make virtual teaching extremely difficult. They're constantly interrupting her, da-da-da-da-da. Um, the Dalai Lama highlights the significance of, um, the difficulty caused by children's interruptions in his paper blah 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 when he notes that interruptions in daily life can lead to unhappiness. And so what I've done here is I've created a transition, right? I've taken this fact, this observation, this thing that I'm writing about, right, this claim that I'm making, and I've transitioned using words like highlights, right? Um, and you can also do, you know, underscores or um, uh, reveals or suggests, right, those kinds of powerful verbs to... Um, those kind of powerful verbs that can make connections um, between what you are claiming and what the research is claiming. Sort of draw those parallels. Um, okay, so that's that. Thing number one. Thing number two. Um, synthesizing perspectives. This is supposed to be the hardest part of this paper. This is a deeply, deeply, deeply challenging part of this paper. Some of you are doing this extremely well. I have a handout in the folder um, last week, and I put it in this week's folder again as well, about how to synthesize perspectives with some really clear examples. Um, but make sure you're using that synthesizing language. So again, let's look at these three example quotes on this separate document that I Okay, so if my quotes are having children at home makes performing work tasks nearly impossible and children can enhance the homework environment because they provide lighthearted energy and opportunities for breaks from the drudgery at home and distracted parents are considerably more likely to fail in work duties at home. Um, I have three different perspectives here, okay? Um, I, and I need to synthesize them and bring them together in meaningful ways. So, um, you know, we can start, uh, I often like to start with my counter argument, right? So you can say, although Heather Jones argues that children can enhance the work home environment because they provide lighthearted energy and opportunities for breaks from the drudgery at home, her claims uh, neglect some critical nuances of the home work environment. 
Okay, so we've started our claim, our argument, our set of our set of arguments with our critical voice, right? Our counter argument. This Heather Jones character is is giving our counter argument. Um, what I have included here is the uh, idea that there are critical nuances in her claims, right? What I haven't said is Heather Jones is wrong or Heather Jones's argument is illegitimate or whatever. I have provided her some legitimacy, right? She makes this argument, but there are some nuances here, right? Um, experiences of women in particular who are working from home reflect the challenges present in balancing uh, their the demands of their jobs against the needs of their children. So this is sort of my transition statement into my next um, my next critic, okay? And here is a critic that I agree with in my set of arguments. So I want to introduce him uh, with some uh, some agreement, right? Um, as uh, Stanford um, maternal experience researcher uh, Stephen Smith suggests having children at home makes performing work tasks nearly impossible. Smith's arguments here are further uh, supported by Elizabeth Miller, who performed a study regarding the ability of parents to balance both work and home duties. Okay, now I'm transitioning into my next critic, because I can't just smash all three of these critics together into this paragraph. I've got to transition for each one. So even though Smith and Miller agree with each other, I'm making a transition happen here. So, um, and with Elizabeth Miller, I'm going to, you know, sort of expound here the idea of a totally imaginary study, but I want to highlight her credibility as a scholar. So what I'm going to do is explain how she performed her research. And that can be a really useful way. We talk about ravening our sources. You don't always have to say Stanford maternal experience researcher. You can also provide that same raven credibility check by explaining what is the study that this person did and why is it a valid study, okay? So in a double blind um, scientific uh, controlled variable study, Miller determined that distracted parents are considerably more likely to fail in work duties at home. Okay. Um, and so now I've now I've really given her this credibility because I said it's a double blind controlled variable study, right? Which is a, a really, really solid methodology for putting together research. Um, and then I would sort of move on to connect this back to my thesis to my research statement. But here in this paragraph, you know, I've, I've provided a counter argument. I've provided two arguments that I agree with that come from slightly different perspectives, right? This um, Stanford researcher is a sociology professor, a social sciences professor. This Elizabeth Miller is a scientist. Those are two different perspectives in the research. And I've managed to synthesize all of them 
into this paragraph, okay? Um, this is the kind of writing that I'm hoping to see in your papers. Um, and again, some of you are doing this beautifully already, but this is an exceptionally challenging thing, and it is supposed to be the hardest part of this paper. This is supposed to be challenging for all of you. If this, doing this writing, takes you a very, very long time, that is totally normal, totally okay, and totally expected, okay? So, um, hang on, I'm going to close a door here to drown out some background noise. Okay, um, so only one more thing to talk about here. So avoiding, I wrote B&W here, black and white statements. The rubric really highlights the need for you to allow for there to be nuance in the writing, okay? So you are writing about complicated issues, and it is a very, very rare complicated issue where it is helpful to lean on a black and white statement. And when I say black and white statement, I mean like an either or, right? You're either right or you're wrong. Um, you know, uh, global warming is either real or it's not. You either agree with me or you disagree with me. Um, happiness, either you can either buy it with money or you can't buy it with money. Um, and a lot of you, I think, in a, in a very, very legitimate attempt to, um, to make your argument strong, are leaning on statements that actually have the effect of weakening your argument. Because the more you lean on these black and white statements, the more you say these sort of polarizing things, and the less you allow the issue to be complex and nuanced, the less legitimate your argument sounds. So you want it to be nuanced. That feels tricky because sometimes it feels like, well, am I even arguing anything? Am I even saying anything? What is the point of my claim here? If I'm saying, well, the issue is complicated and, and it's not clear who's right, um, but that's actually exactly where you should be living right now. Yes, you are making an argument. Yes, you have a standpoint. Yes, you have strong emotions. And yes, you might be right. But you don't want to totally discredit the other side and say that their argument has no validity because then, you, then you're not entering into a complicated, nuanced set of arguments. You're just stating something that's objectively true. Um, and that's, that's not what this paper is about. So um, you want to try to avoid statements like there's only one way to truly understand the situation or that the answer is clear. Um, you really want to avoid saying things like that the critics are wrong. Um, and you can instead, you know, use these kinds of phrases, right? While this issue is complex, the research clearly indicates, right? I love this phrase, the research clearly indicates, or um, many researchers claim uh, very compellingly, um, or there is strong research that supports the argument that, that allows there to be nuance. There's another argument, and there might be strong research that supports that argument too, but you are inserting yourself into this complicated issue in a place where the research clearly indicates something, right? You want to say critics present legitimate claims regarding X. You're not pretending these guys don't exist, and you're not pretending that their legitimate claims, that their claims are not legitimate. Um, but you want to add, however, these arguments are outweighed by the reality of why. I've kind of done that here right? Although Heather Jones argues that, right? Her claims neglect some critical nuances. Those are the kinds of terms um, that you want to be using uh, as you sort of push forward in this paper. And that's it, guys. I know this was a little bit long. Um, I think we're looking at about 25 minutes here, but hopefully it was genuinely helpful. Um, you've got a couple more days to really revise, dig into your papers, um, please revisit the rubric. Please, please, please read your paper out loud. I want you to hear the way it sounds. You can lock yourself in a closet so nobody else can hear you. That's fine, but I want you to read the paper out loud. It is going to make a tremendous difference in your ability to find, first of all, simple typos, simple things you've done wrong, um, but also in your ability to 
uh, hear where your sentences are awkward, where your sentences are too long, where your phrasing is choppy, um, and, and catching all of those things. Next week, you are going to be doing a peer review of a classmate's draft, and somebody is going to be doing a peer review of your draft. Um, so the better the 2,000 words you give me on Sunday is, the better and more useful that peer review will be. You guys are doing uh, wonderful work. I'm super proud of you. Thank you for, um, for everything you're bringing to the table. And um, have a great day.